Okay, so it's with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Linda Birkin today uh, to Ento Live, and she's going to talk to us about the work she's been doing for the University of Sussex, uh, specifically their Buzz Club group and their Airbnb project and, and things associated with that. So, Linda, can't wait to hear about this. Over to you. That's all right. I'm trying to work out which bits of the Zoom pop-ups are going to be showing up on my screen. I can't. Never mind. That's that's just going to be there. That's fine. Uh, Hold on, there we go. Right, I think that is now, yeah, okay. Uh, so hello everyone, and as Kieran said, this is the first of the Buzz Club Ento Live webinars. A uh, little bit I, about me, I am Dr. Linda Birkin. I have my expertise in citizen science and uh, entomology kind of more generally, but also basically about working with people and working with volunteers to do projects that investigate something that it would otherwise be very hard to investigate um, if you didn't have a lot of volunteers helping you out. Um, I'm going to be talking for the majority of these slides today. Uh, my colleague Isabel Sexton, who also works with me on the Buzz Club, is going to do a couple towards the end, and then we are going to be taking your questions. So, uh, yes, as, as I'm just trying to think where, where I am now for introducing, yes, so for the Buzz Club, uh, we're based at the University of Sussex. There's going to be a little bit more info about us coming up. Uh, but we focus on uh, setting up these citizen science projects, these experiments that can be done in gardens, uh, often looking at some element of wildlife gardening and seeing whether or not it works. Uh, because there's a lot of things you can do to make your garden more friendly for wildlife. And there is a lot of advice out there on how to make your garden more friendly for wildlife. And we would like to know how much of it actually works. So I will move on to my first slide. My first slide uh, is where I'm doing a little bit of introduction of citizen science, the concept thereof. Um, as I said, it is about volunteers getting involved with science. It's amateurs getting involved with projects. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't be a professional scientist, just like you're not employed by the project. You're giving your time voluntarily. And a lot of ecology in the UK has this brilliant history of citizen science. So a lot of the recording schemes for many, many, many different parts of nature are uh, citizen science based are based on people going out and recording either on like very stratified sampling methods or ad hoc or as in this wonderful little cartoon uh, there's all different sorts of ways and there was only ever becoming more ways in which people can get involved with citizen science can use their expertise as part of a group to find out something about the natural world I think it's a really exciting way of getting people involved in these things that we're really interested in so citizen science. Uh, back onto the Buzz Club. So as I said, we are based out of the University of Sussex. Professor Dave Goulson, he, he of the television and books and so on and so forth, uh, directs the Buzz Club. Um, and it is a, a club. You can join. We will come to that later, obviously, but you can join up uh, with the Buzz Club, get on our mailing list and find out about what we're doing, join in with projects and contribute to finding out stuff about what's going on in your gardens. Um, so we design these projects to be suitable for citizen science. And this means they have to be, essentially they have to be not necessarily like overly simple, but they have to be very set out so that people can definitely be very clear about what it is that they're doing, what they need to do it to do and what they need to record in order to do it. And ideally also not to be too expensive with the Buzz Club, we try and make sure that all our projects are actually free to take part in uh, because we don't want to gatekeep being able to be involved in science. Um, and then there's also an element of whether citizen science is the best way to get the data that you are looking for. So citizen science is brilliant when you want to do a really large geographical area over a very short amount of time. So you may have uh, heard of some studies such as the Big Garden Bird Watch, where it's like go in your garden and count the birds over a period of time. That's a really good use of citizen science, because if you were just in a more traditional science like you and a couple of research assistants tried to go into everybody's garden to count their birds, it would take a very long time, be prohibitively expensive and involve more forms than anybody wants to get involved with. But if you want to go into your own garden and count birds, excellent. And we get this really, really wide ranging snapshot of what's going on. So we are less interested in birds. We are more interested in invertebrates, hence the Buzz Club. Um, and we are getting like minded people who are interested in doing those sort of projects into one place coordinated with us. Um, we want a two way proper conversation going on so people can email us ideas that they have or questions that they have. We'll get back to them. We might be able to develop other projects to look into other things that we hadn't thought of. 
Um, so it's supposed to have this sort of two way feedback thing. And we are focused on what you can do in gardens and green, green spaces, but mostly into gardens, private gardens. What can you do with your garden space to actually help wildlife? So a lot, as, as I said, there is a lot of wildlife gardening advice out there, um, and a lot of it is about providing habitat or providing resources in your garden that are otherwise not going to be there or may not be there in large amounts. So for, for bees, for example, you might be trying to provide food resources. So you might be trying to make sure that you have planted plenty of bee friendly flowers uh, to provide the pollen and nectar that they need, or you might be providing nesting resources or like water resources, something like that. That's what the bottom two pictures on here are. Um, I'll, we've got a bee waterer, which is essentially a dish full of uh, little stones. So it is water that bees can get to and be safe. So they don't just sort of sink into a big open thing of water. Uh, the other one is another one of our projects called Hoverfly Lagoons, which is about providing a little sort of a little slice of habitat where habitat is water with leaf litter and grass mouldering in it, which hoverflies think is fantastic and will lay their eggs in it. So these are some of these examples. When you're providing a new habitat or a new bit of habitat or an extra resource, there are things that you are going to want to know about how well it works. So firstly, do they work? Do they actually do what they think they're going to do? Do they provide the resource that they are claiming to provide or for the habitat? Does it actually provide habitat that that type of critter wants to use? So that's a thing to look into um, because it may be that, you know, they've been designed as this should provide this this we, you know this animal likes this kind of thing we'll put some more of it in the garden but you may might have missed some of the actual physical characteristics of the habitat that the critter actually likes or perhaps it is in the wrong place or something like that so finding out if the intervention actually does the thing step one um the second one of there we've got is do they cause problems um, because we do know and have seen examples of where wildlife gardening interventions done with the absolute best of intentions turn out to have other problems that come in. Um, no shade on birds, uh, but for, you know, bird feeders and bird baths, it turns out, as we, we found out as in, in more recent years, that uh, they could become a point source of disease very easily uh, because you've got a lot of birds all coming to one place, potentially in densities that you wouldn't naturally have them going there and they are licking everything and defecating while they eat so that's been a problem um so it's just sort of trying to one of those things of trying to find out are there additional issues that might be being caused by these habitat provisions or the resources being provided in the way they're being provided and is there any way for us to improve on that um, final bit are they helpful you might well be providing the habitat you think you are. Uh, it might not be causing a problem, but what does it does it actually do something useful? So, you know, from the point of view of the animals themselves, for us, for the insects, like, are they increasing the population of the insects? Are they allowing uh, shelter and things to for them to go through extreme weather events or something? Is, what is this actually doing? now it's in your in your garden um and then on top of that there are other considerations so for you know bee hotels like this are they increasing the population of bees honestly not really sure hasn't been done a lot but it may be that just by having something that is fairly neutral that bees will like to use um and can be observed by the people that are looking after the bees you will have that really positive wildlife interaction that positive experience of you know looking after your bees and it improves people's relationship with nature and their willingness to actually do more complex or difficult or, or whatever things that they are willing to do to support their nature and that feeds into is it useful for conservation does it connect together um, or help connect together existing patches of other habitat. Um, does it do the thing? Well, if we're going to test it, we're going to need to test it in gardens. And this is where a structure like the Buzz Club comes in, because we got people to go and do that. Right. I've talked. Oh, we've got we've got this little video. Ah, uh, you don't have sound. Like <laughs> it started the sound on mine. Um, so. There are many sorts of wildlife that you could be looking after for your wildlife gardening, and we're looking at solitary bees in this project. So for the little bit of, again, where we are, um, most bees are solitary bees. Um, people generally know quite well about sort of honeybees and bumblebees, the ones that have these eusocial large nests where you get lots of bees living together and that 
whole interesting life cycle. Uh, the majority of bees are not like that. The majority of bees are solitary bees. Um, and as we've got on the slide here, we've got about 250 species of bees in the UK uh, that are these solitary bees. So uh, they will emerge at the start of the year, usually not all of them at the start of the year, but a lot of them are quite early, quite sort of spring flying bees. They will mate fairly soon after emerging. And after that point, it's basically the female bees who will go and find whatever habitat they like uh, and find an appropriate nest site or construct a nest. And then as shown on the bottom there, they will make like a little cell, a little pot essentially at, at the back of the nest, fill it up with pollen, lay an egg on it, close it up using whatever materials it is that they use. Um, and then just keep doing that along or up or through or what, wherever they have decided to make the nest. Um, males will mate with the females at the start of the year. They will do some pollinating uh, because they're going about um, but after that point, they're not doing a huge amount. They're not really contributing to uh, production of more bees. They're just, you know, male bees waiting to see what happens. Um, <laughs> but for solitary bees, there are so many different types. Like we think people tend to think when you think of bees as a honeybee or a bumblebee, but solitary bees come in so many different sizes and shapes and tongue length and hairiness and all this that they are providing pollination to a really, really wide range of plants, particularly like wild plants that may not be as well served by honeybees and bumblebees or bees that we've put in encouraged to uh, to like go after vegetables and help those out. Um, we also get some quite interesting effect with solitary bees because most of them don't have that sort of specialized pollen carrying equipment that honeybees have, where it's like, you know, hairs on the leg, or they will pack it neatly onto the leg um, and sort of comb themselves and be all tidy with their pollen distribution. A lot of solitary bees just sort of smear it all up and down the bee. Um, and then when they get to the nest, they will scrape it off. Uh, for pollination, from the plant's perspective, this is better because you've just got a bee covered in pollen rolling around in your flower and may actually be doing this more efficiently than efficiently from the point of view of the plant than the honeybee, which is being very efficient from the point of view of the honeybee. So they're a really important part of the pollinator guild and they're pretty understudied because they often are just sort of small. Some of them are very pretty, but some of them they could be very, very cryptic, a bit hard to see. And people don't necessarily realize what they are, but they are really, really important. So bee hotels are one of those wildlife gardening interventions that is to help out uh, solitary bees, specifically the subcategory of solitary bees that are cavity nesters. A lot of solitary bees are like ground nesting bees. They'll nest in the ground in holes. Um, cavity nesters are the sort of solitary bees that would be naturally nesting in old plant stems, in cracks, uh, in walls and that kind of thing. Apparently they are actually quite a problem in old churches because they can drill through into the soft mortar um, and make nests in them and start to wear out bits of your church. Oddly specific things that you end up learning when you're studying bees. Um, but yeah, this is a, a subcategory of solitary bees and they like tubes. They like holes. They, they will use those. They will provision those. They will use those as their nest. So bee hotels are a way of providing lovely tubes for the bees to use, providing this nesting habitat. And given that the theme of the day is tubes, uh, there are a lot of ways of doing this and probably a lot of ways of doing it wrong as well. Um, but for example, on the side here, we've got two types of bee hotel. Uh, the one at the top is a, just a drilled wooden block. I think this is actually from Dave's garden and he's taken a drill and he's drilled holes into it. And it's clearly been very popular uh, with mason bees of some kind where they've used soil, filled it all up, lovely accommodation. Um, the one below that is uh, from a company called Wildlife World that we've actually done some work with to help design bee hotels. And this uses a lot of different um, types of materials. It uses different sorts of holes. It's got a, a bigger variety uh, of options for your bees in your hotel. Uh, and if you look up on the internet, you know, how to bu buying a bee hotel, how to make a bee hotel, there are a plethora of a, a bits of advice and information and designs available to you. So, and and also in terms of like, I've got that, that last bullet point there in terms of maintenance of whether, you know, you have tubes that you take out. Are you, are you putting your bees in a drawer over winter? Are you just leaving them there? There is a lot, a lot. To, to take into account when you're thinking about the best way to do the bee hotels. So we are interested in, is there an ideal bee hotel design? Now, 
we don't really mean that there's going to be one absolutely perfect bee hotel that you could make and it would be wondrous and ideal and everything would love it. It's more kind of given the circumstances and the things you have available, are there some things that you should really be doing? Or also, are there things that you should be avoiding? Which is going to hopefully lead me to the next slide. It is indeed. There we go. I remember the order of my slides. So we are looking into what it's a good idea to do in bee hotels. So we're testing that. We already know some things it is a good idea to avoid in your bee hotels. Um, and I will just do this this quick bit here. So I have two pictures on here. Uh, the right hand one is a bug hotel uh, sourced from free Google images. And the one in the middle is actually a bee hotel that I have. It is the worst bee hotel that has ever been purchased from a, for a member of my immediate family. Um, I have stolen it. And it is my example for everything about this is bad. Uh, so things that we know are not wanted by bees in a bee hotel. Tubes that are too big is one massive problem. Um, a lot of bee hotels that are you know, sort of sold in the impulse buy section are not actually made in the UK and maybe being designed for places that have larger bees. Um, even our biggest solitary bees are a little bit larger than honeybees. They're not huge bees. And this uh, hotel example here, I could probably get my little finger into several of those holes. That is too big. It is cavernous. Um, the bees have got to make that little cell. They've got to put the pollen in it. They've got to do a lot of work. And if they have to fill up a huge amount of extra space with padding, uh, that's a lot of work for a single mother working on her own. So they're not very keen on ones that are too big. Uh, the fact you can see through the tubes uh, does not help. Uh, bees do not like using tubes that are completely hollow all the way through uh, because you have a, un, you know, an unlockable back door that is just open. So any predators or parasites or things that just fancy a little snack can come in through the back and eat the bees, the larvae, the pollen, just wreck the entire joint. Not a fan. Um, and then the other bit, swaying and cold, is you will notice this is on a bit of string, on a bit of rope. You will often get bee hotel designs uh, like designed to hang out of a tree in a charming rustic fashion. These are useless. Bees do not like being shaken about. Um, it seems to not quite be agreed on why this is. Like maybe it's the pollen moves around and the larvae can roll off and get squashed. Maybe it's just unpleasant. Uh, maybe it's indicating that the where they are is, is starting to break down or something like that. Either way, they don't like movement. If you have a bee hotel, fix it really firmly to something. Uh, the final point of this, um, on this, just on this one, of things we already know, uh, bee hotel and bug hotel are not the same thing. Um, and they can get assumed to be that. So a bug hotel is more like the thing on the right without those bits that probably are bee hotel. Uh, a bug hotel is essentially a sheltered, pile of nooks and crannies, all different sorts of things, wood, cra cracked pots, uh, the ubiquitous pine cones, straw, things, lots and lots of little spaces for all your mini beasts, beetles and spiders and millipedes and wood lice and all those uh, to find the right bit of habitat that they like, that's somewhere that's cosy for them. Um, if you have a bee hotel directly on top of one of those, it's basically just providing a buffet of bee larvae and pollen to anything that could be bothered to climb. So, you know, your earwigs will steal pollen, spiders could just web across the entire front of your bee hotel. Not a good idea. Um, bee hotels also ideally should be raised up. They should be sort of metre and a half or so, kind of eyeball height off the ground. So if they are on top of a pile of logs, you're not going to get any bees in them. You'll probably get earwigs in them, uh, but that's a different project we have. So... Those are the things that just I, I just wanted to put that slide in, because when I'm talking about bee hotels, there is a lot we are looking into in terms of what is the best. But uh, this is this things that we know are bad can provide a useful starting point for anyone who's thinking of buying or making one themselves. So on to our actual project. Um, so this is uh, the Buzz Club project. It's called Airbnb. There are several bee hotel related projects that are not ours out there called Airbnb because it is a lovely pun and I refuse not to use it. So I'm going to keep calling it that. Um, the idea behind Airbnb is overall we are, it's where we are looking at specific characteristics of bee hotels and we're trying to work out what variations on those work the best. So for this year and last year, for, the, for this part of Airbnb, we are looking at the diameter of the holes used. 
So a lot of the advice that you'll get when you are to DIY a bee hotel is to use eight millimeter holes. Um, these are known to be good for red mason bees. They're known to be liked by red mason bees. But as I have said, a lot of our solitary bees may be bigger or much, much smaller than red mason bees. And hotels and holes, rooms in a hotel that are too cavernous will not attract occupants. So we are looking at whether having a different distribution of hole sizes attracts a more diverse population of bees to your bee hotel. Um, we are using a drilled wooden block for this. Uh, this is not necessarily going to be like the ideal hotel design that we think you should use. Um, but because this is an experiment, we want to be able to standardize the hole sizes as much as possible and getting everyone to, you know, go and buy a load of bamboo canes and measure them will be a pain and you will not get many people wanting to do that project. But one drill bit is very much the, si the, the size of another. They are standardized. So we're getting people to drill holes into the wooden blocks to make this experimental hotel. Uh, once folks have done it and we've got advice in the protocol about how to randomize your positioning and how to set one up, once you've got your bee hotel in place, uh, the actual data collection is just taking, well, it can be as simple as just taking a photo once a month to see what is in the holes or what's been used to close them up. Um, and you could also record yourself what you can see and what uh, you've used to fill the holes in. But like we can compare those things together. Um, so yeah, that's it's once once a month and we will get some idea. We won't be able to get species from that, but we will be able to know like, is it mason bees which use mud? Is it blue mason bees which use chewed up plant material? You've got leaf cutter bees that use leaves. Um, and then there's wilder and stranger sorts of bees like resin bees that use plant um, secretions, plant sap in a way. And then you've got bees that use a special spit. So there's all sorts of bees. Um, and we would like to see what variations we get on these. Um, a quick point before I move on. We are focusing on diameter of holes. We are not focusing on depth this year. Um, these hotels that we are using for Airbnb probably don't actually have the ideal depth for a bee hotel because the ideal depth on bee hotel is like 15 centimeters or so. Um, these are not going to be 15 centimeters because we're just asking people to use the drill bits that they have uh, because again we want to keep the costs down and we don't want to tell you to go and buy a long terrifying drill bit and most standard drill bits are sort of eight centimeters or so um, in, in depth, in length, that sort of thing. Um, so these holes are probably a little bit shallow. Um, this is a decision that we've made because we want to see how interesting uh, sorry, how interested the bees are in the holes. And I mean, as you can see from the photo on the top right there, bees will also just use random holes that are in your bricks that are clearly just a roll plug deep. Like bees do seem to be willing to use shorter than ideal holes. And that's the popularity and like when they get filled up is what we're looking at, not necessarily to do with the depth. Um, I'm going to talk about depth a little bit later because it, when we're thinking about future projects we could do, depth is something we'd want to look at. But for this one, we're just saying for people, use a standard drill bit, they're the things you have. So, uh, Airbnb, so, so that's what the Airbnb project is. We did do it last year. Uh, we did run it last year and we're running it again this year. So here is some examples of hotels that were for Airbnb 2023. And I'm a little sad that Airbnb 2024 doesn't rhyme. Uh, but we've got, as you can see, like different sorts of drilled blocks put in places on, on walls in more sheltered locations that we've got them filled up with uh, a bit more obviously mason bees for these but there were also some of leaf cutters and things and we have this lovely picture of a leaf cutter sent in by one of our volunteers uh which i don't know what hole size that leaf cutter is trying to use but that it's gamely trying to put a very large piece of leaf in them so it is uh it's a really interesting project to do because it gives you an excuse to get really nerdy about your bee hotel and have a look at what's going on and peer at them i like that <laughs> Um, so what did we find last year? Well, last year was a bit of a pilot year, um, mostly due to my own life circumstances. I did not have time to push it earlier in the year as much as I'd want to. And uh, a lot of the solitary bees are early bees, they're spring bees. Um, so we had 34 signups in, in total and of these 15 hotels returned data. So it's not actually a bad number for citizen science. Um, it's a lot. You get more signups than you get data returns. And somewhere in the middle here is the chaos of life, uh, because uh, we got 15, whole, 15 hotels worth of data. But we did have information from uh, like quite a few of the other people who were involved of like why they were not able to return data from their hotels. Things like woodpecker happened and just 
blitzed it um you've got things that just fell down uh, like you've got extreme weather events all sorts of stuff happens when you are in real garden environments which is one of the things that's quite fun about doing citizen science uh just for the what has gone wrong now <laughs> um but we still got a reasonable amount of data for this we just didn't really get enough to do you know full statistical analysis but there was enough to indicate that this is still interesting we didn't kind of get data and go hmm i don't think this is going to work well for a second year this did seem interesting so we've got uh 324 holes uh across all the hotels of which 156 were used by bees of some kind um and they did seem seem with this top graph here that there would seem to be a little bit more of a preference maybe towards some of the smaller holes um which you know given that eight millimeters is the one that is recommended that's that's potentially interesting. Should maybe we be recommending eight and six? We don't know. We're going to have a continue to have a look at this and see whether or not um, we would be more likely to recommend that. Looking at the material um, used to fill those holes, uh, it's very clear that leaf cutter bees very much like the bigger ones. We did not get any leaf cutter bees at all in the smaller ones, which does make sense. Leaf cutters are quite big bees, um, so like just physically ramming a leaf cutter in there would be difficult. Uh, but some of the more I guess unusual when you when you are setting up a bee hotel when you're looking at the the information the advice for it a lot of it will focus on mason bees and leaf cutters so some of the other ones like the blue masons and resin bees they seem to be popping up in the smaller holes so that's you know feeding into our are you getting a better diversity if you have a more interest a, a, a wider variety of hole sizes um so oh yeah, well, here is our second lovely video. Um, this by, by uh, another member. So this charming little bee here uh, is actually it's called a yellow-faced bee, um, and this sort of plasticky stuff that it looks like it's using at the front of its its hole is actually um, it's a type of spit. Um, they produce this themselves, uh, and they use this to actually to make their little nests and to make the caps and to, cl to clean it off. It can look a bit like. Um, webbing it can look a little bit like it's it's um i've just forgotten the word for web now anyway there we go it could look a bit like that but it is actually um indicative of this type of bee but these are very very small uh so yeah for 2023 the red masons if you've got them they seem to be pre fairly gregarious they will use a lot of different sizes for holes in fact if you don't have a very large bee hotel the red Ma and red masons are there they will seem to gamely try and fill up absolutely everything so there's no space for anyone else so it may be the case that we end up having the advice that an ideal element of a bee hotel can be do one later if you want or have leaf cutters so that they haven't had a chance to be pushed out by the masons but as i say we have not done full statistical analysis on that data because we haven't really got enough of it yet um and we're going to run it again this year now we have had a couple of other the participation findings listed there is that because one of the things that's very important when you're doing citizen science is to listen to your citizen scientists like please tell us what did work or what or what didn't work ideally what didn't work as well is great because we can't actually know unless we're told and you know if if one person has a problem and can't make the protocol work that might be on them but if you're getting you know multiple people having the same problem then it may be something that you need to change on the actual design end and particularly as all the as i said before all the weird stuff that can happen in gardens could just be things that you haven't thought about you haven't thought about it and it's not in your garden so it's not something you thought you needed to put in um we had fairly simple simple feedback on this luckily enough um some of the stuff in my phd got a bit strange but these ones were were much more um simple so uh originally we had our data collection be take a photo and count your bees once a week um this became a bit unwieldy not so much when there was a lot of activity because when there's a lot of activity it's quite exciting you know this hole is filled up i've seen this bee there's a little face sticking out but once the activity dies down and you get more into kind of major bit of summer where a lot of the solitary bees have finished and with its more individual groups that are working um it that gets a bit arduous for the volunteers to take a photo of a box of bee tubes that's not changing um so we're going to adjust that um we also had a request for people to try and like stand by their bee hotel and take photos of the individual bees because if you're going to identify to species um you've got a better chance with a really good photo but it turns out that's a bit ad hoc. So we were asking people if they could do that when they were taking their photos of the hotel. But then it's sort of like stand in front of a wooden block for 15 minutes and try and take bee photos. It didn't really work very well. 
Um, so what we are advising, because it still would be useful to get photos of bees, but what we're advising now is that people just put their bee hotel somewhere that they remember where it is. Uh, and if you happen to see a bee on it, as you go past, snap a picture. Like I've got mine just at the front of my house. So whenever I leave, I could paparazzi a bee. Um, the other bit we had feedback for was waterlogging. Last year was very wet. Last year was unreasonably wet. Um, and yeah, it turns out a, a big problem that you get with the drilled hole style of bee hotel is that when wood gets wet, it swells and it can splinter into the hole. So the holes start looking spiky. I mean, they're not that spiky because they're damp, but they start blocking up. They're less attractive for bees because if a bee's going to push its whole self down a hole and it's got the delicate wings on the back, if the holes are spiky and the holes may cause danger, sorry, cause damage to the bees that they then can't heal. So we are emphasizing quite a lot uh, for this year. Please put a nice waterproof hat on your bee hotel, put it somewhere sheltered, something like that. In fact, uh, I actually have quite a good side observation for this, uh, for showing how important shelter is. Uh, this is a shed at one of the gardens that I work at. Um, and these are just bamboo tubes that were in an old bird box because they'd been cut up for bee hotels and not used. And over the course of last year, at least four types of bee came inside the shed through the window to use this upside down box of bamboo tubes. Um, so we had blue masons up there for the, the chewed plant bits. You've got your leaf cutters in the bigger holes. You've got the mason bees with the mud. And then you've got some of those examples of the uh, yellow faced bee, the sort of cellophane spit. And the fact that they were just quite merrily coming into a building to use these that were or say also like the wrong way up and on a shelf. Um, yeah, shel shelter is really important for your bee hotels. That's something that uh, we're trying to emphasize quite a lot more. And also I now have this wonderful photo of tubes to illustrate uh, what the differences are between the different sorts of filling and how you're going to be able to uh, see what bees have used the hotel. So Airbnb 24, uh, we are doing it again this year. Um, so as, as I said earlier, we are emphasizing put it somewhere sheltered and give it a roof. Um, we're moving to a monthly data collection. As I when I introduced the project, I said it was monthly. That was what we decided to do this year because you can get a reasonably good idea of um, how quickly the hotels are filling up for the month. And it's also not arduous and you have to do it every week. Um, otherwise, everything is the same. What we're actually asking people to record of like level of detail and things is the same. So we should be able to use 2023 and 2024 data together um, and do some more hefty stats on it. Um, at time of writing these slides, uh, we were ticked over 50 people signing up. Uh, the project is open now uh, for signing up. Um, you can technically join it at any point, but because the solitary bees are a spring kind of organism, um, it would be better if you did want to join it to get a bee hotel up before kind of the end of May. Ideally in April, sort of May would be a good time to do it. And here's just basically a set of examples of bees that have been seen in bee hotels that have been set up for the project in 2024. So we are hopefully um, gonna be able to say something a little bit more conclusive about preferences on hole diameter and variety of bees that we get in them as a result of this project. And this is where I talk about the future, then what will we do with it? Um, well, we will use the information from the project to advise our own uh, our own advice, our own designs, our, our potentially our partnership with, with other groups about uh, the best bee hotel to use in that situation. Um, what we could then look into as the Buzz Club, um, we need to have a bit of a think about this because some characteristics of bee hotels are gonna be quite complicated to actually do an experiment to test anything about. Um, and it might be a bit of a big ask uh, for broad volunteer groups. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, like people who are particularly keen on doing a more complex protocol uh, wouldn't be able to do it, but like we would have to base it on like, we probably wouldn't get as many numbers of people taking part and all that, but that's the thing. So uh, we could look at emergence rates or sexing of the bees. Um, it's possible, it's a bigger ask because essentially you have to take your bee hotel, put it somewhere like in a box with mesh on it and make sure that you are keeping an eye on it whenever something is likely to be emerging so that you can find the bee, take a photo of the bee, identify the bee and let the bee go before it dies because it's in a box in your shed. Can be a bit tricky. Um, depth of holes is something that I would like to look at. Um, again, would involve either a more complicated, well, would involve a more complicated design of bee hotel. You can make the ones with the perspex down the side so you can see in, which is very cool, but also 
requires more DIY. Um, or you can do where you put card, card or paper straws um, down the hole so that when they've been capped off, you can take them out. Um, you can take out the bee cocoons and you can get an idea of how far down they've been used. And that would also allow you to get an idea of like how much parasite attack they'd had or something like that. But it does require, as I say, a lot more handling of things. It also requires you to find paper tubes in the correct diameters. And I have learned that it is easy to find 10 millimeter sorry, uh, paper tubes, because these are for boba pearls, eight millimeter paper tubes, because these are normal tubes, um, and six millimeter paper straws, because these are for fancy cocktails. No one seems to do seven and nine. So if we were doing depth, uh, we'd probably have to reduce the number of diameters we were doing. So we're kind of trying to look at those characteristics one at a time. Um, the other thing would be about cleaning, uh, about cleaning out a bee hotel, when do you, how frequently do you need to do it, what different designs are more or less able to do that, uh, does that actually have an effect on the build-up of populations of pests, uh, it is going to be another one where you would need to be able to actually extract things from the bee hotel. Uh, so there's various options, um, we are always welcome to hear other people's uh, things that they would like to know about bee hotels as well, like maybe we would have missed something, uh, so absolutely let us know. Um, We've got two other bee projects going on this year, one of which is actually a bee hotel related one with a, a slightly different slant on it. So uh, there we go. Yes, there is a quick run through of Airbnb, where we are, what we're hoping to achieve with it and why we're doing it. So I will come back to you. For, well, I'll come back to the final slide and then we can go on to Q&A. Uh, but at this point, I am going to hand it over to my colleague, Isabel Sexton. And I'm just gesturing off the side of my screen in the hope that she's there somewhere. Uh, to I do am the next here. couple of slides. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Here is your slide. Thank you very much. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Izzy. I'm the other research assistant for the Buzz Club. Um, and there's just a couple of projects I wanted to talk you through that are bee related. Um, so the first one is the Big Bee Hotel Experiment. Um, this is created in, in partnership with Wildlife Community. Um, and whilst Linda's experiment on Airbnb is focusing specifically on whole size, we want to gather as much information about all the bee hotels across the UK, as, um, as many as we can, um, and ask as many questions about the different factors that could change the occupancy of the bee hotels. Um, so to take part in this, all you have to do is register your bee hotel with us. It can be a homemade bee hotel like the Airbnb one. So register those if you take part. Um, but it can also be a branded bought hotel as well. Um, and what you'll do is you'll register your bee hotel with us, um, answer a bunch of questions based on dimension, location, aspect, the plants that are nearby. Um, and then just send me a photo once a month of your hotel. I'll then be able to look at that photo and figure out if there's any trend between the occupancy, the types of species that you've got there and the design itself. And very excitingly, um, if you complete this project, you have the option to be entered into a £250 prize draw courtesy of Wildlife Community. So you might be able to buy some nice garden um, resources there as well. Um, this uh, experiment is also um, going to be used by London Natural History Society as a trap survey across London. So there's going to be an extra additional step that you can take part in. You can do this across the whole of the UK. We'd like to get as much data as possible, but um, everyone in London, a big shout out, please take part. Um, what we're going to ask you to do is join our iRecord activity and just take pictures of any bees that you see visiting your hotel, whether they're nesting or just resting, sunbathing on your hotel. We'd like to know about it. Um, so yeah, that's the Big Bee Hotel experiment. Hopefully it sounds good. And Linda, can you skip to my next slide? Oh, I can. Thank you. Um, and so this one is not focusing on solitary bees. It's focusing on bumblebees, but is definitely worth a mention. So this is our Bees and Heat Waves project. Um, last year, we uh, did the first round of this project and we are using it to look at how bumblebees react to heat waves and whether their, um, the activity rates change, whether they're foraging at different times, and also whether the plants that they are using change as well. Um, so last year, we surveyed 1,413 bees and their behavior throughout different temperatures, so uh, before, during, and after a heat wave. However, I say heat wave, we didn't actually have a heat wave last year. So this year, we'd like to repeat it because we definitely got some interesting results, which will be published soon. Um, but we'd like to repeat it without it being as reliant on there being a heat wave. So just different, um, a wider scope of temperatures. 
Um, and for more information on this, there is an Ento Live on the 5th of June, which is run by the project lead and myself. Um, so please book onto that and then find out more. Join the experiment. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, okay, Linda. there we go. Back to, yep. uh, back to, back to me. Back <laughs> to the studio. Um, no, so this, obviously, Izzy has just talked about some of our other bee-related projects and I've mentioned the Airbnb. We do have other projects with other insects. Uh, we've got one on earwigs. We've got one on um, insect identification, covering things more broadly. We have things on pollination. Uh, we have hoverflies and all such things. So we have a lot of stuff going on. Um, and because these are all citizen science projects, the more people who uh, will do the projects and can record data, uh, the better our conclusions can be and the better we can give advice, do papers, do talks, all those sort of things. So if you are interested in any of the things that we talked about or finding out more about the Buzz Club, um, you can become a member. Uh, becoming a member is free. You can just sign up to the mailing list um, and you will get our newsletters quarterly and possibly one terrifying giant one from me at the end of the field season, but we may adjust that. Um, information about the projects that we're doing, early bird access to events, information about when we're gonna pop up in webinars or other things. Um, if you are feeling particularly generous, and we hope some of you are, uh, you can become a sponsor of the Buzz Club. So for a minimum of two pounds a month, you can keep Linda and Izzy in a job. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got various uh, tiers of sponsorship um, that include sort of sponsor packs. Uh, I see Izzy is now laughing at me in the corner. <laughs> um, or we've got, you can also do one-off donations and all other such things. As, as with everyone in ecology, uh, we will always accept a donation. It would be lovely. Uh, other than that, we are on social media. We're on most of the, well, we're on quite a few of the social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, X, whatever it is, uh, LinkedIn. I think those are the ones we're on. Um, if there are any other social medias uh, that you would be interested in finding out what the Buzz Club was doing on, or do let us know. We may not have time to do it, and I refuse to tell Dave what TikTok is, so... Just let, let us know. We'll have a think. Um, we've also got other, other stuff on the website, other areas on the website that are not just purely about the citizen science projects. Um, so one we are trying to do quite a lot more with is Buzz Kids, where we're going to have resources and information and stuff for you to do specifically with kids about fantastic bugs and the outside and how you can make up your own projects and study them. Um, and we also have a section for local facilitators. So if you are a member of a, a local group, an allotment group, some sort of community hobby group, whatever, where people will be interested in any of the sort of projects that we do, um, we have a group that you can join and we can provide you with resources and hints and tips and information and all that all that jazz. Um, if any of this has, has caught your attention, uh, not, not just the donation ones, but also the donation ones. Um, if you want to check out this QR code, it will take us to the website, take us to the website, take you to our website. And obviously, Kieran will put all of the links and things into the summaries for this and into the recording. And that is our webinar for today. So we will move on to the Q&A. Um, no more slides from me. And thank you for listening. So I will now stop sharing my screen.